From the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center and Understanding Evolution, this is the Evolution in the News story for September 2010. I'm Kristen Jenkins. Here we have a tale of bugs meet poison, poison kills most bugs, remaining bugs conquer the poison and return home. Not a nice bedtime story from our point of view, but a classic in terms of evolution in action. In the 1950s, Bedbug populations in the United States were decimated by DDT. Now they are returning, possibly coming back from other parts of the world where they were not wiped out by pesticides. And they have evolved resistance to several of the pesticides that we currently use. Dr. James Crow, Professor Emeritus of Genetics at the University of Wisconsin, did some of the early research in evolution of pesticide resistance. Dr. Crow is one of the founders of the disciplines of population genetics and molecular evolution, two fields that have a lot to tell us about how evolution works, specifically how mutations arise in individuals and how beneficial mutations can become more common in a population. But his experience with bed bugs and pesticides is more personal. Well, I participated in two of the scourges of the 20th century. I had, I, I had the flu in 1918 and survived it, but I also lived in a house that had bed bugs when I was a grad student in the 30s. And uh, <clears throat> I can tell you that bed bugs are no fun. For me, they're a, like a mos- bed bug bite is like a mosquito bite, except maybe 10 times worse. And it, on me, it raises a welt. And in this house where I lived, there were half a dozen of us living there. And we finally discovered where the bed bugs came from. They came from one particular bed. And that person never noticed them. So apparently he was either immune or to it or, did, or didn't feel the bites. Um, and we uh, I finally got rid of them by methods that you wouldn't use nowadays. I simply closed the house up and fumigated with cyanide. And that, that got rid of all the bed bugs and everything else that was in there at the time, too. Given this experience, It may not come as a surprise that Dr. Crow was interested in the evolution of pesticide resistance. And I started studying uh, insecticide resistance in 1948 or 49, thereabouts. And I decided I was interested in uh, what happens to genetically when a population becomes resistant to DDT in particular. And so what I did was uh, I used a Drosophila population used Drosophila, because we have all the genetic trickery that's available in that species that wasn't available in other insects. And so that meant that when I developed a resistant strain, I could analyze it and see where the resistant genes were. <clears throat> so I did this in a studiously careless manner, just to smart Im- to imitate nature this way. So I had these thousands of flies growing in a cage, and then I just poured DDT on the floor. And that killed most of them, but not all of them. And then a little while later, the population grew up again, so I'd add more DDT. And after doing this for, a, for a, quite a short time, only a few months, I had population of flies that walked on DDT and loved it, as near as I could tell. So then I analyzed them by making crosses from the resistant strain with the susceptible strain, and I was able to show that there are resistant genes on each of the major chromosomes of Drosophila. Dr. Crow was laying the groundwork for future population genetic studies with this work, which answered some of the questions researchers had about evolutionary processes. I feel a little bit like a pioneer because at the time I was doing this, these studies, there wasn't very much known about resistance to insecticide. We had a lot of theory and a lot of thought, but there wasn't any genetic analysis of it. Uh, one of the questions that arose at the time that I was able to answer and it was uncertain most, for most people working at that time. And that was whether the uh, development of resistance comes from uh, genes that were already in the population or whether you had to wait for new mutations. And clearly the answer in this case, in my case at least, was the former. I was able to show that the, uh, that the evolution depended upon genes that were already there. And I was able to show that, one of my students did it, by using inbred lines instead of randomly mating populations, inbred lines don't have genetic variability. And so therefore, if there's any resistance in those, it would be from new mutations. And there wasn't any resistance developed. So that showed that it, it was not due, in this case at least, to new mutations. 
but the genes are already in the population. Dr. Crow's research showed that some of the random mutations which occur constantly made flies resistant to DDT. Selection, however, is not a random process. It's very specific, and in these experiments quickly eliminated flies which were not resistant. So why did only a small proportion of flies in the starting population have these mutations? I think this means that the uh, genes for DDT resistance that already existed in the population must have been slightly deleterious in the absence of DDT, otherwise it would have been more common. But what happens as you introduce DDT into the population and then these genes that cause resistance to it have a sudden advantage and they increase in frequency and after a few generations you have a population that's uh, resistant to DDT. Due in part to Dr. Crow's work, we're not really surprised by rapid evolution of resistance, but at the time this information was groundbreaking and when he started his work no one knew what to expect. Well we had, everybody had ideas on the subject and one person after another pointed out that if you believe in natural selection you certainly would expect resistance to arise and sooner or later. We hadn't much idea what I, what I mean by sooner or later though, whether we'd have to wait a thousand years or whether it would happen in one or two years. Probably what people were su most surprised by was that resistance in house flies, especially in mosquitoes, it just happened in a matter of four or five years until they became, until the DDT became essentially useless. In the so I think maybe the speed of the evolution came as a surprise to some people. I think this is a particularly good example of natural selection at work. Natural selection in this case is the insecticide but, and it happens in a very short time. So we see happening in a year or two's time, something that most evolution has taken hundreds of millions of years sometimes to take place. But the, evolu but the selection pressures are very strong and that means the changes happen, uh, happen rapidly. We learn an awful lot in research by studying organisms that are not in themselves valuable. It would, the kind of studies that I did Drosophila would have, in Drosophila would have been much more laborious or impossible even, in other insects that didn't have this tremendous backlog of knowledge of genes and chromosomes that could be brought to bear on this, on this question. So what I did now was, we would now call this QLTs, the quantitative trait loci. Well, we didn't call it that in those days, but that's what I was doing. I was marking chromosomes and regions of chromosomes and discovering whether there are resistant genes located in that, in that particular spot. Uh, one thing I might emphasize, <coughs> is that back in the 1950s, 40s, and 60s, we didn't have the techniques that we have now. Molecular biology has changed everything so we can analyze uh, DDT and uh, various kinds of chemical processes. <clears throat> in those days, we had to do all this very indirectly. And you do a lot of work to get a not very important answer. Now, now, I sort of wish I were starting over in a sense because it's so easy to do experiments now and get definitive results that are using molecular techniques that are so powerful. So I'm envious of, I, I have molecular biology uh, envy, you might say, for not being able to start over again. But I'm afraid that's not in the cards. We asked Dr. Crow how he got into science. In high school, I took most of the, all the science I could get. I had the world's worst physics teacher but I still loved physics, remarkably. That it's a wonder he didn't destroy all my taste for the subject. Uh, but and I came very close to becoming a physics major. And then when I got to college, <clears throat> I was in some doubt about uh, whether I wanted to be a scientist or a musician when I was starting on college. And then I discovered, in good time, I must say, that I really wasn't that talented in music, and I better find something easier. So, so I. I went through college. I majored in, uh, in both biology and chemistry, not being sure which subject I wanted to go into. And then I applied in, uh, for graduate school in both subjects. And I took the first fellowship I could get. I was so, this was then, I graduated in the depths of the depression. And everybody was nervous about getting any kind of employment in those days. So I was so relieved to get a fellowship offer. And two or three others came in later, but I had, already, I had already accepted. So I had a happy career as teaching all sorts of things to naval trainees. But then when I finally moved to Wisconsin, uh, 
I thought I'd try the big leagues and try a research career, and I thrived on it. I've loved it ever since. The importance of understanding the evolutionary processes that have resulted in pesticide resistance in bed bugs and other insect pests will help us to develop more effective and long-term solutions to insect problems. So what can we do about bed bugs now? The Center for Disease Control, or CDC, has information about how to avoid and treat bed bug infestations, which reflect what we have learned from evolutionary research like Dr. Crow's. Meanwhile, we can bring back the old saying, sleep tight and don't let the bed bugs bite. For more information about this story, including links to primary and popular literature and classroom resources, visit the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center website or the Understanding Evolution website. More stories are available in the Evolution in the News archives on either site. The National Evolutionary Synthesis Center is funded by the National Science Foundation to promote research in biological evolution.